There we go. Hi, Ben. Hello. I'm just going to adjust my camera as well. It looks like it's changed a bit. All right, I can hear you well. And um, welcome to those of you that have joined us. Today we are hosting um, our Stay in the Game live podcast. I guess it's not really a podcast. It's a little bit of a video as well. And the Stay in the Game live is actually to allow us to showcase practitioners from our team that can, or the community, that have opportunity to basically help you help yourself stay at it, work, life, and play. And today I am really honored, Ben, thank you for joining me. And this is our third ever Stay in the Game Live. And we're actually talking about all things shoulder. So with the shoulder itself, uh, which we're gonna dive into today, if you're joining us here, um, on this live, please get ready to um, learn some stuff, ways to help yourself. But I want Ben to introduce himself first. So, Ben, who are you? And a little bit maybe about, um, yeah, background with shoulders, that kind of thing as well. Yeah. Hey, Mel, I'm happy to join you today. Um, so I'm a physiotherapist at the Downtown Collegiate Sports Medicine location. I've been here for uh, coming up on four years now. Um, so I did my master's degree out in Vancouver and lived and worked out there for many years before uh, relocating back uh, home and uh, joining the collegiate team. So I've always kind of had a, a favorite body part to treat in shoulders and I've done a few postgrad courses on shoulders because of it. So yeah, if I, if I had to pick a body part to treat, shoulders are definitely right up there. So when you had uh, put out the request to any practitioners who wanted to, to join you today, I kind of leapt at it. So um, yeah, happy to chat shoulders today. Thank you, Ben. No, that's awesome. I know the nice thing about a shoulder is it's so complex. And often with a practitioner like yourself up for the challenge to look and really dive into an area like that that people struggle with so much and people as in us practitioners you know it's it's a tricky area complex as hell and yeah so I think the first question that I have uh, for you is really just people hurt themselves all the time and you know people come into the clinic and say Ben you know I did the silly thing you know what is it that you see most often and and just so people can really relate yeah, so uh, you kind of hit the nail on the head there with uh, how complex shoulder injuries can be. Um, it's funny because I do shy away. You know, I, I'm not one of our concussion therapists here because concussions are really, really complicated and I don't want any of that noise. But uh, yet the shoulder, I'm, I'm all game for. So, yeah, it's kind of interesting that uh, uh, this is one area where when it gets complicated, I get kind of more jazzed up to treat it. So. Yeah. Yeah, there's a myriad of ways to hurt your shoulder. Like, it's probably easier to list off, like, you know, activities they could do that wouldn't hurt your shoulder. Like, that would be definitely a shorter list. Um, but, yeah, like, we, like, even just today, I had about four shoulder patients. Uh, one had had a fall on her shoulder while skiing. Uh, another slept in an awkward position uh, a couple of weeks back, and it just hasn't felt the same since. Um, a lot of lifting and reaching under load. So, you know, any of our manual laborers, uh, but just like parents lifting up their kids, uh, which, you know, any parents that have joined us would know, like, as they keep getting heavier and heavier, it keeps getting harder and harder to do it. And then actually, since moving to Alberta, um, I don't think I saw a single horse related shoulder injury in my five years in Vancouver. And like my first week in uh, Red Deer, there was a, probably like three or four uh, horse related shoulder injuries. So again, a lot of, a lot of different ways you can, you can hurt yourself for sure. Crazy. Um, okay, well, um, so yeah, basically anything goes then. Um, when you kind of see something going on in the shoulder, what is the most common thing that people say that they can't do or that it, it like, how does it feel? Like, and I know there's a million shoulder injuries, but common yeah. things will be like, hey, I can't do this or whatever. Sure. Yeah, and we'll we'll get into the kind of how I subcategorize shoulder injuries a little bit later here when we talk about um, you know self assessment at home that people can do. But um, one of the the most common uh, things that they'll describe is just I just can't. It just feels different. I just can't use it the same as I as I yeah. used to. Um, typically, the the number one thing is just like any sort of overhead reaching or lifting, which again we do do a lot more of in a day. Uh, uh, than we've realized. It's kind of like, you know, you don't take your, uh, your walking, uh, or you do take your walking for granted until you have an ankle injury. And then you realize, you know, how important your ankle is. So similarly, with basically anything you try to do day to day that involves your arms, your shoulder is going to play a huge role in that. So 
Um, typically, again, for our most common shoulder injuries that we see, which is, again, generally a weak and painful shoulder, like generally a, a rotator cuff injury, it's going to be um, – sharp pinching pain with certain movements but just kind of more of a dull ache at rest that can you know radiate all the way down to the to the elbow in a lot of cases and obviously there can get you know more complex shoulder involvement when you know there's nerve roots involved if there's you know concurrent neck pain with it that can you know delve into more uh neuropathic referral like pins and needles and tingling and numbness and um you know complete loss of strength but Generally, it's um, it's really sharp and pinchy when I go to do this, but when I just sit here right now, it just kind of aches. Uh, and then, yeah, just over time, like depending on how long they've left the injury for, they just find it gets gradually weaker and weaker and weaker, and it's just harder and harder to do the tasks that they they need to do. Um, so it, it is generally speaking, you know, just like a, a with regards to like an ankle injury or a knee injury, it's just I I was only noticing it when I was doing these certain tasks, but eventually it just starts to take over every single uh, facet of their day. And it, you know, becomes unignorable at some point for, for most people. And sleeping as well. Envisioning. Yeah. That's one of the biggest ones. And again, I'd mentioned earlier that uh, one of my patients today, it was literally, there's no other source other than she just slept on it wrong one night. And, um, and again, that can kickstart a, a, a brutal cascade because if you're not sleeping well, it's really hard for your body to, to heal. So again, if you're not getting comfortable positions because of your, your shoulder and, you know, it's not as easy as just, oh, well, don't lay on the, the side that hurts because, you know, sometimes just having the affected side up, if it's draped in a certain way, it is even worse than when you're laying on it so um yeah unfortunately sleep can be a, a really tough uh thing to to figure out until we can actually like get them out of pain or you know hopefully help get themselves out of pain and, and sleep a little bit more comfortably okay um not really in any kind of particular order but i i mean obviously if we were to look at um two twofold question one is the importance of early assessment but prior to that like is there something like some ways I can move or test myself to kind of be like, God, I can't do this. So I should come in uh, or this certain movement hurts. And so I should come in. And then second question is how important is getting it assessed by somebody early or, or can I wait a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. And so just to your first question, um, there are obviously, you know, certain issues that you know you're not going to wait around for and generally people will will know like if they have a very violent mechanism of injury and they can tell that their their shoulder has popped out of place it's dislocated or it's you know something is deformed in the shoulder they're usually not like ah oh, maybe i should just give this a couple days maybe it'll settle down they're usually on their way to the er or the urgent care center or wherever you know uh, uh is closest and they're going to get it assessed uh properly right out of the gates and you know get imaging on it um so yeah, certainly like there are cases where, um, so either that's where like there's clearly a visible deformity in the shoulder indicating either a fracture or dislocation. Uh, but for some patients, even just extreme, extreme pain, even if it doesn't look awful from the outside, if they're uh, in 10 out of 10 pain and, and can't get under control within you know a couple minutes, a couple hours, like they will find themselves in ER eventually. And again, in those cases, sometimes it's a subluxation and there's still damage in the shoulder and they just, you know, you can't see it necessarily. Um, but you know, that's definitely more in the minority of shoulder patients that, uh, uh, you know, we see and, you know, as far as shoulder injuries go, it's, it's definitely less common than uh, just kind of the gradual insidious onset shoulder pain that, um, uh, you know, you can kind of do a bit more of a self-assessment at home to determine how urgently you need to, to get somebody to take a look at it. So, um, yeah, as far as like kind of home assessment goes, uh, it's, it's tricky because, you know, we're learning more and more in recent years that, you know, all the special tests that we have for the shoulder that, you know, you and I learned in school and that, you know, current physio students and current athletic therapy students are learning in school. Um, you know, a lot of those, uh, and if they're just kind of looked at in isolation, don't have great clinical validity yeah. and reliability. So even the special tests that we do aren't always... Uh, useful at telling us where the shoulder is injured. Like it will tell us, yeah, your shoulder hurts. And, you know, it's definitely testing positive on this test, but it's sometimes trickier to narrow down exactly what's going on. We honestly get, you know, probably 90% of the way there on a diagnosis of what's going on just from chatting with somebody and asking them questions rather than the actual uh, objective assessment where we're getting them to move their arm around and, and doing certain tests on the shoulder. Again, those tests are still important. They're still giving us some good information, but um, again, just talking talking to a patient and, you know, asking them some questions generally gives us a better idea than um, most of those tests to begin with. Yeah. 
That being said, it is definitely still possible to get some really good information at home, just doing your own assessment to direct you on where to go next. And again, whether that's to just continue to monitor it at home uh, for a few days or to schedule an appointment with a, a therapist or uh, to immediately head to your doctor to, to get some imaging. So um, a few years ago, I had taken a, a post-grad shoulder course that essentially kind of subdivided shoulder injuries uh, and shoulder patients into one of three groups. And um, even just like knowing kind of which group you fall into can kind of give you a better indication as to you know what you should be doing going forward. Um, so there's the stiff and painful group, the loose and painful group, and then the weak and painful group. So, um, you know, all three of those groups will, will have slightly different symptoms. And yeah. as far as self-testing goes, the two easiest self-tests that you can do uh, to figure out which of those three groups that you fall into would be range of motion assessment and isometric strength testing. So uh, again, you don't need to go to school for years to figure out how to do those tests. They're pretty easy to figure out. And um, yeah, we can kind of quickly chat about it right now. Um, and again, to preface, like if a person is experiencing extreme unrelenting pain, particularly if they've, you know, had a traumatic uh, mechanism falling from a large height, you know, off a ladder or high speed motor vehicle accident or, you know, quadding injury or, you know, something significant, or it has that visible deformity in the, the shoulder, they shouldn't even attempt these tests. They should head straight to the nearest urgent care center or hospital and, and you know, get properly looked at. Um, but if pain isn't too terrible, if it is, again, that more, it's kind of crept up on me over the last couple of weeks and just keeps getting worse and worse. Um, range of motion self-assessment is generally pretty safe to do. Um, and again, as a ball and socket joint kind of alluded to earlier, there's a lot of movement available at the shoulder. Um, there's a lot of different ways it can go wrong because there are a lot of different structures in our shoulder. Um, so yeah, basically just checking your range of motion and all the, the directions that your shoulder allows you to go into. So flexion, extension, uh, uh, abduction, horizontal adduction, uh, internal and external rotation. Uh, this can be done actively, so them just doing it themselves, or if they, you know, have a family member that they trust uh, who's not just gonna wrench their arm around, um, doing more of a passive range of motion assessment where somebody else is guiding your shoulder up, forward, back, across, um, just to see if it's an active contractile structure or more of an inert passive structure. And again, that doesn't always uh, uh, tease out, like just because you have pain with active range of motion and no pain with passive range of motion doesn't guarantee that it's a, you know, a muscle tissue or a tendon tissue, but it does give us a little bit more of a, an indication that that could be the case. Um, so yeah, again, it's important to know that, you know, presence or absence of pain on active or passive still doesn't allow somebody to self-diagnose. Again, that's that's tricky enough for us to do, much less somebody at home that, that doesn't have that kind of training. But again, it can help them narrow down maybe where the, the problem lies. And again, what they need to maybe do going forward. Um, so next, uh, we uh, kind of talked about the range of motion stuff. An isometric strength test would be the second kind of safe home test that they could perform themselves just to, again, try to determine what to do next. Um, so a resisted isometric is literally just up against a wall, pushing with no real change in the, the range of motion, just again, contracting uh, the muscle tissue around your shoulder just to see, okay, does that elicit any pain? And again, that can be into abduction, that can be into forward flexion, internal rotation, external rotation. They can check all those cardinal directions again and again, if the source is contractile, like a rotator cuff muscle, there's a good chance that they're going to feel pain on some of that resisted testing. Um, and again, if, if it was as simple as, oh, pain on resistance must be a muscle uh, tissue, again, that would be lovely. That's not always the case. Like uh, a labrum can get irritated with resisted testing, um, a hill sack lesion, a slap lesion, like they, you can still have pain in other areas. Um, but again, it does give us a little bit more information. It gives you a little bit more information as to, to what you do, need to do. Um, complicating this even further is the fact that, you know, we used to think that the rotator cuff worked in isolation. Like if you just do this movement, you're only testing one of your four rotator cuff muscles. Or if you're just doing this movement, you're testing this individual muscle. And we know now like all four muscles of the rotator cuff, they all co-contract with pretty much every movement of your shoulder. So again, just doing isolated internal versus external rotation doesn't even allow you to for sure say it's this muscle versus that muscle. Um, just that, yeah, it's probably one of them. Um, so yeah, again, as you kind of alluded to at the start, like the shoulder's com complicated and the more we study our special tests for the shoulder, the more we realize, yeah, that's, that's really true. Um, so yeah, you'd kind of asked, uh, you know, based on some of this, like what 
should their next steps be? Like, can you just kind of self-monitor at home versus um, do I need to go get an assessment from an actual physiotherapist, athletic therapist, um, massage therapist? Um, and yeah, there's there's a, a, a couple different ways to determine whether or not you, you really do need further intervention. Um, again, generally speaking with a shoulder injury or any injury in the body, again, if you give it that kind of first week or two and things do seem to be progressing every day, you feel a bit better and things are generally trending the right direction, you're probably okay. Again, it doesn't hurt to reach out to your, your uh, uh, therapist to, you know, just get their opinion on the matter. But um, again, people know their bodies pretty well. And if it does seem like things are healing on their own, then yeah, generally speaking, it's okay to just wait and see. Um, but if you are finding, which, you know, most people uh, inevitably do, things keep getting worse and worse over time. Pain continues to uh, uh, perseverate and not only perseverate, but actually get worse and worse. Um, again, even just doing that self-testing, we can't formalize a diagnosis just based on that at home. So yeah, that's generally speaking when it's a good idea to, to go in and chat with a physiotherapist, athletic therapist, or, you know, whoever you want to see about it. Um, so yeah, that's uh, uh kind of where we're at. Now, if we want to go back to that subtype, the stiff and painful, loose and painful, weak and painful group. Um, again, the stiff and painful group, uh, if they're ex experiencing like complete loss of range of motion, all different directions, um, that can be, you know, something pretty significant. Uh, there's generally about three different things that can be. It's either frozen shoulder, which um, uh, is thankfully pretty rare, but there's a specific patient population that that primarily yeah. affects. Uh, glenohumeral osteoarthritis, which again, tends to be more of an insidious thing. It doesn't kind of come on quite as suddenly as frozen yeah. shoulder or post-trauma. And again, that's something that they would have known. Okay. I, I smashed my shoulder falling off my horse two days ago. And, uh, yeah, no, like I probably do need to go get some imaging to make sure I haven't broken anything. Um, so generally speaking, all three of those, like if they cannot move their shoulder at all without extreme pain, yeah, that, that warrants a, a trip to, uh, if not the urgent care center or the ER, at least to the, uh, uh local physiotherapist, athletic therapist, uh, you know, chiropractor clinic. Um, to, to get somebody to take a look at it and determine whether there's a need for further diagnostic imaging. Um, that second group we talked about, the loose and painful group, um, again, that tends to be a, a, a group where, again, it generally is going to be a, a, a traumatic injury that causes uh, uh, the shoulder capsule to feel loose. Um, again, it's uh, typically a, you know, if it's a, a basketball player, a volleyball player, they took a hard impact and the shoulder felt like something popped in or out of place. Um, and again, depending on the age of the patient, depending on if they've got a prior history of dislocation, um, will determine whether or not that person does need urgent care. But um, that's one that they can kind of monitor and self-assess and just see where things are going. Um, generally speaking, though, if they're pretty convinced that it popped out, um, it's never a bad idea to go get an x-ray to make sure that you haven't fractured something uh, in the shoulder. Because um, if you have fractured something, it can, you know, uh, lead to some pretty poor outcomes if it's not addressed right away. Um, but then again, that third subtype, which is probably 90 plus percent of the patients that I see is just that weak and painful group. Again, if you can still move your shoulder, like, you know, yeah, it hurts in certain ranges, but you can get it uh, uh, overhead and you can move it around a little bit. It just feels quite painful to do so. And um, maybe it feels a bit weaker than the other side. Um, again, that's a group that if they aren't seeing rapid improvement in their symptoms, um, Again, they don't require urgent uh, medical attention, but they could come in and see a physiotherapist or athletic therapist and, and get an assessment to figure out what's going on. Okay, if, um, if somebody only had, um, let's say time and money was a factor and they're out of town a lot, um, maybe it's just a matter of time and they have an opportunity to get in once, um, would you ideally have them come in the day it's injured? the day after it's injured, a week out, like, you know, maybe it's not the hay, the traumatic, fell from a height, it's just, it's yeah. sore and it's not really getting better. What's, what would you do if it was your family? Yeah, so as you said, like if it's not that traumatic injury where, you know, you definitely do need to go get it, uh, get it looked at. If it is just something that's been kind of stubborn and let's say it's been, I don't know, six to 12 weeks and it's just been kind of staying the exact same, then yeah, like if, if it was going to get better on its own, it would have shown some indication of that earlier. So again, if it's only been 
a day or two since the shoulder started feeling sore and you can manage okay you know you can still get through your day you can still um, put your baby in their high chair or you know take your dog for a walk or you know unload the dishwasher and put the cups back on the highest shelf then yeah you probably don't need to to rush into the clinic to to get an assessment um, but again generally speaking once that you know first two to three weeks of that inflammatory stage are over if we're not seeing some pretty rapid improvement by that point where you know pain does seem to be improving on a, if not a daily basis at least a weekly basis then that would generally indicate a need to to go get looked at um, so yeah, I would say just to create a general rule of thumb, if you just tweaked it uh, playing golf or you know shooting hoops with your your uh, yes. friend or your your son or your daughter or whatever, then yeah, like just you know monitor it over the next little while. Um, again, if it seems like it's it's a manageable level of pain for you, then you know you probably don't need to rush off to the clinic. But yeah, generally speaking, by that second or third week, you'll have a pretty good idea of whether or not you're getting better, or getting worse, and and you know that'll be your, your cue as to whether or not to go in or not. Okay. Um, are there certain things like, I mean, I know we're getting maybe technical on this, but like a certain rotator cuff or bicep mm -hmm. long head tear, like, is there a labrum, like you mentioned labrum, like the shoulder issue inside the shoulder? Is there something that if I injure that today, that mm -hmm. would really be a bad thing if I waited a week or two? Uh, well, no, like it's, it's one of those things I've, I've had people with labral tears that they know exactly when it happened. And it's not until six to 12 months later that it's even discovered on the MRI. So you can survive and you can, you know, be somewhat functional with a, a you know, slap tear, a, a bank art lesion. Like it's not ideal. Like we would ideally like to know that stuff right when it happens and, and send people off. But in the nature of healthcare in Canada, you can't just, you know, stroll in and, and get an MRI within an hour, you know? There, there are wait times. And uh, unfortunately, just the, again, the way the healthcare system works, um, you do kind of need to fail conservative management for, for injuries like this before they'll consider sending you for, for an MRI, which again, gives us the most information we can, can possibly get on the, the internal structures of the shoulder. So an x-ray, yeah, that's pretty quick. Like, you know, if you've had a fall from a, a large height or again, a very violent mechanism of injury, they can get an x-ray within an hour. Like it's it's pretty quick to, to get that kind of stuff done. MRIs, again, just because of the um, uh, cost associated with, with uh, performing M MRI, um, it does take longer. And again, it's, it's a bit of a cue, you know, it's a bit of a, a wait. So um, as far as like, identifying whether or not something like that is going on earlier though to potentially give your your physio or your athletic therapist a bit of a heads up on on what's going on generally speaking if you're experiencing um locking or clunking in the shoulder like uh not just like a, a little click or a pop in the shoulder but it is you know a hard clunk or it's getting stuck in certain ranges and you can't move it around. Yeah, that's generally indicative of that there's something going on internal to that shoulder that we probably need to get a good look at. Um, again, there's still treatment that we can provide to alleviate symptoms and things that we can you know, teach patients to do at home to self-manage their symptoms while they wait for their MRI. Um, but even somebody who has a very clear labral tear, um, again, they'll, they'll not be able to speed to the front of the line unless they're willing to, to pay for a private MRI, which, um, again, some people are in the position to do and other people just aren't. Right. Um, so things like, you know, reaching behind my back to like do up my bra or, you know, putting that, you know, cup on the top shelf, like there isn't one of those things that it's like, okay, actually, I'm going to maybe change my question. Um, I've got this you know, thing, and it, it hurts to do those, both of those things. Um, you know, my clients will, you know, and yours as well, and everybody will be like, well, should I try to do more of those? Should I avoid those painful motions and just try to stick to things that don't hurt? Is there a, gen hey, I haven't been assessed yet, right? This is before coming in. What should I do there? Yeah, so it's, it is tricky, because people do fear and you know, we do this too, like, and we, you know, know better, we know pain isn't always correlated well with actual tissue trauma or injury. Um, but I still like when my hips acting up or my neck's acting up, I still, you know, kind of get fearful of certain movements. It's just kind of human nature that we don't want to make a problem worse necessarily. Uh, there's also people that uh, you know, they have a tendency to just completely ignore pain and just push right through it no matter what, because, you know, that's just kind of in their personality to, to do so. Um, so 
you know, we, we don't have to get down the, the entire rabbit hole of the biopsychosocial model of pain. Like, uh, again, there's a, a whole lot of different directions we can go with that conversation. But um, yeah, as far as your, your initial question, like, okay, it kind of hurts when I do these activities. Am I safe to keep doing them? Um, generally speaking, the rule of thumb that I give my patients, uh, I kind of use like a bit of a traffic light analogy. Um, you know, if your pain level, let's say it's like a, I hate using the zero to 10 scale because again, it's very subjective and what's seven to one person isn't necessarily seven to another person, but we'll just use it for the sake of simplicity. If somebody just has like a baseline kind of shoulder ache of like a two out of 10, like it's there, it's not really, you know, bothering them that much, but it's definitely an annoyance and it's definitely on their radar. Um, if you're doing anything that reach behind your back to do up your bra or that, you know, put the cup up back on the shelf, if it jumps up the pain one or two points or, you know, zero points, ideally, if it's just, you know, a little bit more annoyed, as soon as you stop doing that task, it goes back to normal and it's not feeling very flared up the, uh, the next couple hours or into the next day, then it's probably safe to do that activity. And again, that goes for the, uh, uh, exercises that your therapist would potentially prescribe you. Again, some of them are designed to kind of, yeah, irritate things a little bit and maybe not by design, but, you know, just to, to gain the range that we need to gain or, you know, rebuild strength where we need to rebuild strength. As long as symptoms aren't pushed too, too far and calm down pretty quickly afterward, then we're generally okay. If it's that three, four, five out of 10 increase in pain, that's a little bit more of a yellow light. That's like, okay, you know, can we adjust that movement to make it a little bit more comfortable? Can we... Uh, try different ways of modifying that movement to make it less painful. And again, there's different symptom modification procedures that, you know, patients can learn in the, the clinic that we can teach them to, to again, self-perform and self-assess at home. Um, anything greater than that five out of 10, where it's like, oh, I just got a lightning bolt of pain there and it jumped up to like an eight or a nine. Well, again, you might not be causing more harm or damage, but it's certainly not going to love that. And, you know, you're taking the potential risk of making that area more peripherally sensitive. Again, we have these pain receptors all over our body. And if you're constantly making them send a signal to the brain that, hey, there's danger here, there's a problem. Well, that can cause a sensitization effect and your brain will listen harder to that area. So again, even if it's not necessarily causing more damage, it can put us down the track of potentially causing more sensitivity. And again, that's just not always a, a good thing for us to be doing, especially early on in rehab, when we're trying to calm stuff down before we build stuff back up. Okay, I do have a question here that's coming up from uh, yeah. a viewer, uh, Strata15, and we know who that is. That's hey, Tracy. Hey, so she's just asking, can you uh, talk about risks and overloading this joint when it's in a limited range of motion state? So again, the joint's limited. Um, question being, can I load it? Uh, or is there a risk with that? You might have asked it a little bit already, but go for it a little bit. Yeah. And there's a couple of different ways we could talk about this. So I'll use like a few different examples. So let's say it's like a young 16 uh, year old basketball player who just had a dislocation. Um, like we know it was dislocated. She felt it pop out, you know, the whole gym heard it pop out or saw it pop out. And then, you know, either suck back into place spontaneously, or, you know, maybe she had to go to the hospital and get that shoulder relocated. Um, you know, for her, if, if we're trying to protect those ligaments while they heal, Again, there's there's a bit of debate uh, still in the um, the rehab community about how long uh, a first time shoulder dislocation patient should be mobilized for. Um, and again, we don't have to get down that road because again, there's many different opinions on it. But let's say they've been advised by their um, uh, whether it was the sports med doctor that they saw or the physio or the leg therapist that they saw you know what, keep that in the sling for, for three weeks and then we'll kind of see where it's at and we'll slowly try to get you going into larger and larger ranges of motion. Um, well, yeah, like we, we definitely want to make sure that she's careful to abide by those guidelines because if she tries to go into deeper ranges of motion, like it, it can risk that, that joint popping out of place again and then we're right back to square one and if not, maybe a little bit worse off. Um, so yeah, like you can definitely overload a joint in a limited range of motion state from a pure like stability standpoint. Uh, but let's say it's somebody more like a frozen shoulder patient, which um, again, it's, it's uh, not uh, super, super common. Again, it tends to only affect uh, uh, women in their, you know, 50s, uh, plus or minus 10 years. Men can be affected by frozen shoulder as well. I, I'm not trying to just pick on the women. But um, again, it is definitely more common in, um, in our, our middle aged women. Um, so for them, 
the risk wouldn't be that the shoulder would spontaneously dislocate. It's almost impossible for a frozen shoulder to, uh, to really go anywhere. That's kind of part of the problem of frozen shoulder. But for them, if they tried to do too much activity, too much exercise, like if their uh, you know, therapist, and maybe the therapist has the best of intentions, uh, maybe doesn't even realize that it's frozen shoulder and they're trying to get them doing the pulley activity or they're trying to get them to do the cane active assisted range of motion, just trying to get that shoulder moving. Um, well, their pain level might be so high that all we're doing is stimulating pain receptors in that shoulder and pissing it off worse and worse and worse. And like, I, I don't want to be dramatic about it, but I have frozen shoulder patients that were borderline suicidal with how painful their shoulder got. Um, so for those people, yeah, same kind of risk. Like if we're pushing hard with exercise, when they're maybe still in the freezing stage where we know that like, we're not preventing that shoulder from becoming frozen, it's going to freeze up eventually. Um, you know, months later, when it starts to thaw, then we can start doing some exercises to, to regain that range of motion. But um, it is a bit of a risk if we just start to throw them a ton of isometric loading, or we really try to push them into the, the pulleys or the, the uh, active assisted with the cane or the sticker, the, you know, whatever. Um, yeah, we might just be stirring up their pain more and more and more to the point where it's not even well managed by medication. Um, you know, they have to rush off and get a cortisone shot. And even that sometimes doesn't uh, make them feel better. Um, so that being said, um, there are cases where, yeah, we do need to push into that pain a little bit. So again, Tracy had asked, you know, um, is there a danger to overloading the joint when it's in a limited range of motion state? There are certainly those cases, again, the uh, immediate post uh, uh, dislocation subluxation, the frozen shoulder patient. Um, but you know, if it is just a, if we're suspecting a rotator cuff tendinopathy and they are just, you know, a little bit sensitive in movement, well, yeah, we don't want to overload them with, with too much, but we do want to get that shoulder moving a bit. If they just don't move the shoulder, it does stiffen up and, you know, start to feel worse just as a result of that. So, um, you know, it just, it all kind of comes back to what you said at the very start here. Like the answer is it's complicated. <laughs> like, um, there's definitely risks, uh, with overdoing it. There's risks with underdoing it. You know, yeah. it's kind of the tightrope that, uh, a therapist walks with a patient where we do need to load areas to cause tissue adaptation, to see them start to heal and get better and get stronger and hopefully need less of us. Yeah. Um, but if we overdo that, we're just going to stir everything up and make them feel worse. And you're like, well, what am I even coming to see this person for? So, um, so yeah, it's a, as you well know, Mel, like it's, it's a tightrope. Like we, we do got to get these people stronger and more mobile and, and get them moving a bit. Um, but if we do that too aggressively, too soon, not at the right time, like it, it can have, uh, poor outcomes, right? Which, um, again, it's uh, it's tricky because you don't want to lose the trust of your your patient. Um, if they just keep seeing you every week and they keep feeling worse and worse and worse because you know you're maybe not uh, uh, giving them right dosage of of their their exercises. Um, again, it's pretty quick to to lose that trust in the therapeutic alliance, and you know that trust is very important. So you know. yeah. Well, I know one of the things that we, we do find that sometimes we write, we'll give somebody a little bit too much or, or not enough, but because it's so case by case, we still learn something. So ideally, we'll titrate or give people a little bit. And then, um, you know, if we do throw somebody backwards a bit, because we haven't given them a crazy amount, at least it's just a slight bit backwards, and then a huge learning can come from that. So I think a lot of clients will get frustrated. And I think it's still good to allow your practitioner to know that you know, that that didn't go so well, because the learning that comes from that is, is huge. And, um, mm -hmm. and it sounds like a lot of the stuff that you were saying today is just really, you know, everyone's different. Um, take a look at it. Uh, go maybe slow, um, as opposed to throwing yourself into the woods with big changes uh, to your pro your program. Um, I I don't know. I mean, it's, um, it's just such a vague question today being here talking about shoulders. I mean, unless we have a specific person, there is no real right answer or a single pointed answer that we can give. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's, uh, it was a challenge to, you know, to kind of get you to talk about all this in, in, a, in half an hour or so. But um, I, I think I'd like to just maybe, do you have anything else you'd like to add then um, before we let everybody yeah, off? No. No, I, uh, again, you summarized it pretty well there. And uh, I'm sure you've used this analogy with patients before too. Like I, I always try to uh, remind my patients, you know, if they are in a bit of a flare up state and things aren't going well, um, yeah, that's, that's pretty normal. Like that's the stock market recovery. We like to call it, you know, there's going to be those little peaks and valleys, but as long as the general trend is up, like, and it's sometimes 
hard for, for patients because if you're living with that shoulder, or again, this isn't just true of shoulders, this is the back, the neck, the knee, the whatever you know, problem they're dealing with, like they live with it 24 seven, you know, if we're only seeing them once a week or every other week or once a month or whatever it is, you know, they might be making those little incremental half a percent, 1% improvements that do add up. But again, it's so minute day to day to them, they might not see that, you know, huge leap in progress in the course of a week or two weeks or a month. That's why like, as far as, you know, therapists are concerned, like it's important for us to, to be taking some objective outcome measures to show like, that's why, you know, I always try to, if I can be objective with using um, uh, strength measurements in the gym, like, okay, this is exactly how strong your rotator cuff was two weeks ago. Um, you know, your internal rotation was uh, seven kilograms, your external ro rotation was nine kilograms, and now you're double digits on both. So like, even though it's still, you know, feeling kind of sore, you're way stronger than you were two weeks ago. So that is an objective sign of progress. Now, um, again, me just showing them numbers uh, doesn't always make them feel better. It's just like, well, dude, it still hurts. Like, you know, I'm, I'm still dealing with this thing, but it's like, okay, like we're seeing this starting to improve. Now let's maybe target a few other things that we can try to uh, see some improvement on as well. And again, if, if it's, um, it's on us to uh, do our part to, you know, keep patients motivated when things are kind of on that, that backslide. And again, that's tough to do too, because we feel like, Oh God, it, you know, I feel terrible. I'm not getting this person where they need to go. And um, again, that's why it's important to also lean on our teammates. You know, like if I'm seeing a pretty complicated shoulder patient, just because I think I'm pretty smart when it comes to shoulders, doesn't mean that I haven't gotten tunnel vision on something and I'm yeah. maybe missing something important so again that's why it's important to you know consult with our colleagues and hey you know what i was having a tricky patient here you know what do you think this is kind of what i'm seeing and yeah so it's important for us to and not just you know with our team here like i still keep in touch with you know a lot of my uh my physio colleagues back in in vancouver i saw a few of them pop into this uh this chat here and yeah like they're a great source as well like we all kind of takes a village a little bit um and yeah sometimes we've got to recognize that uh um if we aren't sure if we're on the right track with a patient, it's okay for us to, to lean on our colleagues to, to give us a hand because our patients appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. It's, uh, it's, it's a multi kind of a step process as well. And sometimes even if we do amazing at one step, a section of the plan, then we pass them on uh, at other times to, to take. Mm -hmm. So um, well, then I might leave it at that. Uh, for today. Anybody that's joined us today, thank you so much uh, for being here or if you're watching it later. The uh, Stay in the Game Live, uh, again, we plan to do it uh, one or two of these a month. And if you have any suggestions for topics or, or anything like that, please message us so we can try to help answer those questions for you. And if you're looking to book in with Ben uh, or one of our other practitioners, uh, we have an awesome online booking process uh, through Jane, which is our System or just call the clinic. Honestly, our reception is is amazing at trying to uh, partner clients like yourself up with practitioners that are a good fit based on our skills. So if you're specifically looking for a therapist, just ask for that person. So if you're like wanting Ben and just like, hey, I saw him, you know, this other time or whatever, um, and maybe you saw Ben for an ankle or something. You think, hey, he's the ankle guy, but, you know, just um, yeah, ask about uh, some of those other areas that we might, uh, you know, have a good hand in. And also our biographies are online, so it can help too. So I think I'll leave it at that. Uh, ben, thanks again. And um, take care, everybody. Happy Thursday. Thanks, Mel. Take care. Bye-bye. Yeah.